Can y'all hear me? Uh, my question, I guess, is for us. We, you, know, you talked about the axillary balloon pump, and now we use them as our bridge to transplant. We're waiting for an organ. What is our 30 day with the axillary while they're waiting? I guess after they've gotten the device or after they've gotten the organ. Yeah. So that's a that's a good question. Whenever you're using a device as a bridge to transplant, and the heart allocation score is being revised, and you'll see some short-term non-dischargeable VADs um, positioning patients to be higher tier, perhaps compared to where to the past relative to other reasons um, and how patients are being supported. So we look at weight list mortality. You know, national benchmarks are um, around 10%, maybe a little lower than that in the last few years. And so in our experience, and I would say when we formally published the first 50 as using balloon pump as a bridge to transplant, the, the outcomes we focused in on were how they did after the procedure, how they did after heart transplant in terms of long-term success. And, and survivorship was very, very good. In fact, weightless mortality, including our multi-organ experience, was under 5%. Um, so it's a select group of patients. Um, it's with a direct bridge strategy. I can say that we have had to, in one out of 10 patients, 10%, we've had to, um, that needed more support, we've had to change pathways, and either, either in terms of then considering a VAD as a bridge um, or total artificial heart, um, or LVAD as destination therapy. So the balloon pump, I don't want to give the wrong impression that it's the one device for all. It's a starting point. Some patients stabilize on that with extended support, and we're doing a lot in the, in the, in the intensive care unit monitoring their diet and their medical therapy. So it's more than just the balloon pump. But 10% can progress, at least 10% can progress, and in which case you've got to offer more support. In some reading about the LVAD uh, indications, you talk about bridge to transplant, bridge destination therapy. Sometimes you also run into bridge to recovery, and actually LVADs can stop remodeling and in some cases reverse it. Is there any new data out there, how common that sort of a thing is? So it depends on, you know, what, uh, how you define recovery. If you define recovery as, you know, recovery leading to explantation of the pump, that is probably still about in the realm of 1%. Uh, whereas if you look at any LV recovery where your ejection fraction improves, and there is some data to suggest that any recovery, especially defined as you know, EF greater than 10% recovery, leads to maybe slightly better outcomes in those individuals. So, but uh, I, I, you know, overall, the recovery rate has not changed. Now, there are certain protocols that, you know, especially spearheaded by Emma Burks in the University of Louisville, they have looked at, uh, but uh, as far as I know, the, the, the overall recovery experience, uh, you know, other than the hair field experience, which, you know, where they saw a little more. And in the European experience, the recovery is a little bit higher, but I think that's got a lot to do with patient selection. So if you, you, you know, if you look at the patients who have recovered, most of the times, even from the Louisville experience, uh, it is mostly young African Americans who, uh, had non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Now, you could make a case of whether they were optimally, you know, uh, they had optimal medical management or not. And so, um, again, uh, to me, it all depends upon patient selection. And overall, I don't think it's changed much. Yeah, I, th I think that's a fair way to reply in that there are patient predictors of recovery with medicines, that, as there are if you pursue an LVAD and minimize the wall tension in the heart failure syndrome. So younger patients, non-ischemic, shorter duration of heart failure, that exact cutoff, whether it's one year or less than five years, yet to be defined in a, in a robust way, but shorter duration of, of heart failure um, is a profile we get excited about. Recovery prevalence defined as explant the device. You don't need a transplant or a redo LVAD for the remainder of that patient's life, right? The further out with that being met, the greater recovery or the truer it is. So up to as high as 25, up to as high as 45% based upon center's experience. And so you want to still use medical therapy in terms of ACE and or ARB, beta blockers, up titrate, mineral corticoid antagonists, and then the LVAD is reducing the wedge and improving flow. And so that environment the heart's now living in um, can create recovery in some, given the caveats we mentioned. Recovery in general, you go to a registry like Intermax, one to 3%, 1% is the, is the answer. 
but as high as up to 25 to 45% based on single center reported experience. There is some consortium work, more than one center, with recovery rates high, much higher, 20-fold higher than that 1%. But you want to put it in perspective. Hi. Do we have any um, methods of predicting or preventing post-op RV failure in patients who have LVAD implantation or post-transplantation? So I think, you know, it start, one, it starts with preoperative uh, assessment. So I think there are certainly, you know, a lot of risk scores, but at least, you know, uh, at least two to three which are uh, used more, which uh, incorporate both echo parameters of, you know, RV to LV ratio and uh, the CVP to wedge ratio and certain end organ functions such as bilirubin, BUN, you know, age, and being on the ventilator and, and such things to first uh, risk, I guess, uh, risk stratify these patients into high risk, low risk, or, uh, uh, you know, of uh, RV failure in the post-operative period, especially for LVAD. And once you, I think that's part of it. So I think if you are going to take somebody who is, you know, at moderate risk of RV dysfunction, the things to avoid in the intraoperative period are probably the blood transfusions, intraoperative hypotension, and acidosis. So any, uh, you know, hypercapnia, hypoxia are not very good for the RV. Now, he, uh, at least here what we've done uh, is, uh, you know, if we are thinking that as patients are coming off pump in the OR, that they are struggling with uh, right ventricular failure is we have you know used nitric oxide uh, in in these patients to decrease the afterload, uh, and despite that if they've had issues, then we have used temporary right sided circulatory support uh, early on. I think the key is early RV support is better because once you get into a vasodilatory syndrome, it's probably too late. Yes. Uh, what is your experience in using right ventricular assist device in people with uh, severe RV failure, and what are the outcomes of those patients? So, uh, you know, the uh, the percutaneously implantable right ventricular devices are very new. There are really essentially only, you know, there are two devices. One is the right-sided Impala, and the other one is Protect Duo from Tandem. Um, the The data with both of them are very, very limited. In our uh, center, you know, depending on the indication, we use different devices. So, uh, at least in acute MI uh, leading to uh, a right sided heart failure, we've used right sided Impella in a few patients. Uh, it's a, because that's probably easily available in the cath lab. Uh, but in a few other patients who have kind of um, with a uh, chronic RV failure and hypoxia pre exacerbating their uh, RV dysfunction, we've used Protect Duo. But, you know, overall, uh, our experience is limited, but um, um, uh, in my mind, if you're dealing with that, it's, uh, and along with, it really depends upon whether you're dealing with oxygenation or not. If you're dealing with oxygenation issues along with right-sided heart failure, then probably VA ECMO would be the best way to go. Uh, but uh, it really depends on the indication. So if you are dealing with an RVMI, we've used some uh, you know, right-sided impella, but in these other patients who've had some oxygenation issues, we've gone to the tandem because we can hook an oxygenator and uh, use it that way. We've been su <coughs> successful probably about, I would say, 50% of the times. Jerry, if you need to add, want to yeah. add anything else? I mean, I, I agree. So RV failure post LVAD unplanned is deadly. These patients, 30-day survival is five-fold, and their Kaplan-Meier curve survival one year is very, very poor, let alone two years. So we try to select this out as best we can, getting back to the first question. We think we have a pretty good idea of mild, moderate, high risk for RV failure needing a, an RVAD. Um, but there's no one parameter that, that tells the whole story. It's not just the echo report or how big the RV is or parameter of RV function. It's not just the hemodynamics by itself. You really want to look at established models, and I would um, um, encourage you to look at the CORMO score. That has held up at multiple institutions as being a robust model to predict likelihood of RV failure. 
being on the vent, BUN greater than 43, 44, um, and a CVP wedge ratio greater than on around 0.63. So parameters like that, we incorporate ECHO and have validated, derived rather, ECHO parameters, and the RV is just as big as the LV, and the RV function is very, very poor. We're concerned about needing an unplanned RVAD. How to manage it on the back end? Our bias has been we've been using surgical uh, uh, devices, namely the Centromag. We have a configuration to support the RV coming off uh, pump for, for after LVAD, so that helped us tremendously. Um, the role of the right heart pump continues to evolve compared to benchmark survivorship to discharge is looking favorable, but it is very, very challenging. It, not only post LVAD, but post heart transplant RV failure, it's, it's largely medical management. We still have, the right heart pump is approved for support post transplant in addition to post cardiotomy or post MI. So we have that as part of our material, but what Dr. Guha alludes to, when it's in the, in the setting of acidosis, hypoxia, we use central or peripheral AV ECMO to support, just to help that overall environment as opposed to just flow support as an assist device. Dr. Istab, can you please comment on the uh, rate of complications for axillary balloon pumps specifically? Do you see the repositioning and occlusion of carotids yeah, so and uh, sure. hematoma formation? Uh, that's, 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 that's very humbling. <laughs> very humbling for me to stand up. And, you know, the truth is I showed you the projected benefit. And that question's right on, and, and we should ask, well, what are the side effects? What's unique about the balloon pump? So the most common challenge because it's sitting upside down and patients are sitting up and walking is malposition. It, it's still not, we suture it in place, but people walk, they move their arm, and the technology is such that it's not completely fastened internally. So one in four patients, so up to 25%, need for us to have to exchange it in the cath lab at some point with duration of support out to maybe as high as three months. 40%, so a little higher percentage, it's simple malposition where at the bedside we can detect it by x-ray and the balloon pump marker is now starting to come into the ostium of the subclavian, if not in the subclavian. We'll put it on standby mode and uh, with, with gloves on and a mask and we're still above the bandage and we can advance it a centimeter, two centimeters and recheck surveillance x-ray. So that's 40%. The complications I fear most, um, thankfully they're very low, but with the balloon pump upside down, that tip which is narrowed can compromise flow in the SMA or celiac access, and you can cause ischemic colitis. And so out of 120 pumps, we've had a few cases of those. So it's still under one to 2%, but that, that can be a medical emergency. Lactic acid level goes up, they may have abdominal pain out of proportion to exam, and, and it's, it's gut ischemia. That's unique, because when you're the other way, the usual femoral way, you're transversing that, you're not in, right, the, the SMA. The SMA is angulated in such a fashion that's just right for that balloon pump tip, unfortunately, to dip into. So that one concerns me the most. Stroke risk is very, very low. Bleeding risk after is very, very low. If you're gonna get a clot, it's gonna go to the brachial artery. You may have to do, you may get paresthesias, compromise in flow, and it's a brachial embolectomy. And that, that's probably around 3%. Three, three um, so those are, the, those are the big ones. It's not perfect. I think technology needs to improve the platforms. The delivery in the cath lab and bleeding into our peri procedure risks are very, very low, but it's the long-term management. When you're keeping a balloon pump in, and we've had a, a median of around 18 to 22 days of support to, with a range on the upper end to as high as three months of balloon pump support sitting there. So, so more to come along those lines. It's an off-label use of a transthoracic balloon, um, but I think that transthoracic um, strategy is gonna be the future for many of these devices to permit sitting upright in ambulation. I'm, I'm glad we stopped early, right? Yeah. We had all these good questions. Um, Dr. Park, um, how are you, uh, what doses of Entresto are you starting and uh, how frequently are you up titrating the doses since the hypotension is most common side effect? So for the patients, there are actually, there are actually guidelines depending on uh, what uh, your patient is on as far as uh, uh, baseline um, uh, ACE or ARP, and so if they are on a low dose, uh, you know you 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 go to the the medium dose, uh, and then 
and then you, uh, like I said, you need a 36-hour washout period from an ACE. You can replace one or the other with an ARP. If you're starting de novo, uh, you start for the low dose, 24, 26 milligrams. It's twice a day. And, uh, and you know, um, I usually uh, make sure that they get a phone call from somebody to make sure that they're doing okay, make sure that they're keeping a blood pressure monitoring system and so forth. It's not something that I would start de novo in, in an elderly population with a very uh, marginal blood pressure. Again, this is from personal experience. But somebody uh, with a, you know, a, a relatively stable blood pressure, uh, functional class two or three, heart failure, not in any overt symptom that needed hospitalization. So I think that would be your ideal candidate. Um, we have, I think there's also more use of this agent in those with um, um, half PEF cohort, where blood pressure and, and some sort of RV involvement is also an, a, an issue. Now, um, uh, now cost is, can be prohibitive because it's, it's off-label off use, but we've also seen this uh, patient population uh, respond well too. So um, I think this is gonna be an agent that you're gonna see more and more into the future. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for your attention. Good luck, have fun.